guess we already have some people here. I know it's been a while since I've been up. I'll explain all that. Uh, of course, I have been backing off, as most of you know. Uh, for a long time, I've said I, I think I've talked about nearly everything I can, and discussing the world situation is just uh, ditto, 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 uh, slightly different day, but pretty much the same old thing. But uh, I kind of promised I'd do this one some time ago, so uh, here we are. That's what we're going to do. Uh, I do have the chat on. Now let's see if we've got anything here that's up and running on my other computer. I do have my... Yeah, it looks like it is. Okay, so I'll be able to look at the chat. I think we will probably engage in that to some extent today. Welcome as you come in. Today is the uh, 22nd of January, 2024. Hard to believe. And a lot of crazy things going on, as most of you know. Around the world. Uh, and interestingly enough, I have been able to get ahead of a lot of this because of my study over the last several decades. And uh, as most of you know, I'm not uh, a traditional anything. I'm not a traditional Christian. I'm certainly not a Jew, even though I make a habit of studying uh, what I consider to be some fairly important literature and uh, spiritual guidance. Uh, aside from some of the problems with it, but I've looked at a lot of different religions and uh, I've never really at least not in the last few decades ever really latched on to any particular one uh, And there are good reasons for that but at any rate uh, I think I don't want this to be a necessarily a religious discussion tonight although it's going to touch on obviously the archaeological and historical evidences for the origins of Judaism, and that should ring a few bells for everybody. Uh, it has to do with this book here. Yes, I finally got my copy. This is in the description box for the Amazon uh, post, that, uh, or, yeah, post that you can uh, order it if you want. Uh, the hardback copy is uh, 35 bucks plus shipping, uh, depending upon if you have you know, free shipping or not. And uh, no, I haven't read it yet. I'm, I haven't. I haven't. Even, I've just opened it up and kind of thumbed through it very quickly, uh, because I knew that this is going to take some time. I know that this is going to take some time, and I'm going to pick it uh, in. Well, I'm going to be very thorough. Let's just put it that way. Although I have a lot of trust in what I've already found out about this particular subject matter. So we're going to uh, go with that and see what's happening. It looks like we're having a few problems with the camera. I'm not sure what that might be. Uh, might just be holding up the book in front there. So I'll be careful not to do that again. Why did I decide to do this today? Well, I ordered this book a few days ago, uh, and I'm traveling. I'm not, I'm not at home. Uh, I'll just let you know I'm in Washington State right now. Uh, we have a family member that's extremely ill. And no, it has nothing to do with uh, the, the extant sickness of the last few years, nor uh, the extant treatment uh, that most people who have any brains and uh, guts refuse to uh, partake in. Uh, this is a whole different situation altogether. It's very serious. And I'm up here to just kind of be, I guess you could say, a, a second caregiver uh, in case they need something that... Uh, would not be wise for either of them to go out for um, and that's all I'll say about it but I'm going to be here for a while it looks like I've already been here for a week a week plus <laughs> and uh, it's very likely I'll be here for uh, very likely uh, at least several months so uh, this th th these are my accommodations <laughs> see the camera is not straight oh well big deal I have to have it at slight of an angle, so you're going to see angles in the picture. Uh, but, uh, you know, being a caregiver, a, a primary caregiver is very difficult. Uh, I did it, of course, with my wife, Carol, and I, I know how difficult that is. So that when I got the call about this, that uh, the, uh, the spouse just couldn't handle everything that was required, I packed up the very day and, and headed up. So... Again, I'm in Washington State. Um, I don't know that if there are people up here that uh, would like to meet or whatever, I don't know that I'll be able to do that because the situation, 
here is quite, quite critical and uh, I have to devote most of my time to being available to help out. But you never know, you know, things might improve or there might be a situation where I can take a little time. Uh, just let me know in the chat. Uh, the best thing to do would be to, if you have X, Twitter, to give me a DM there. That would be the best thing. Felicia Lockhart's here. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, I, I, I should always notify, and I never do, my mods that I might be doing this. Uh, Felicia had an interesting program uh, that touched on the subject that I'm going to touch on tonight. She had it earlier this week uh, with R R Robbie, I think is his name. Uh, I was not able to watch it uh, because of what I'm doing here. I, I, did, I did quickly um, peruse it um, real quick. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Thank you for the prayers. I appreciate that, Marita. Uh, th this subject matter is very difficult because it, it basically strikes at the very roots of Judeo, and I shouldn't even use this term, Judeo-Christian tradition. And that's what it is, it's tradition. A lot of it has no, no basis in uh, factual history or archaeology. And there's been a big debate on this for a long time. You know, they go out there and they do these digs in Israel and in other places in the world to try to figure out what's happening. Basically what occurs is, is uh, and, and, I, and we've seen that in science lately, uh, so-called science. And you know, that is that they have an agenda to prove. And uh, it's very rare that you find someone in, in a scientific field, especially in history or archaeology or medicine for that matter, who is willing to see past the imaginations, the hopes, uh, the agendas of people and actually do something uh, that examines it with reason, logic, and honesty. And for that reason, I decided to, uh, to, to talk about it tonight. Uh, and that's, again, this book here. It's interesting that almost everything that I've said about the origins of, of uh, Judaism uh, and then subsequent to that rabbinic Talmudic Judaism uh, has been pretty much verified here. And I haven't even read it yet, but I know what's coming because I've done a lot of the pre same preliminary work. I haven't been out on digs doing this, but my study of history and what, what is available and the contradictions and the, the, the things that don't make sense in our, in our what we call the Bible has been a subject of my investigation for, for many, many years, as, as some of you know. You can see I've used this Bible a lot. It's really torn up. <laughs> I've got, I've got, I think I've shown this before. I mean, it's really well used. You know, I've got... Uh, notes and things in here, pages and pages, and you, know, you can see I really marked it up. Uh, this was my primary study Bible uh, when I first started and on through probably about, uh, oh, 2000 or so, and then I got a hold of the, a permanent copy of the Hebrew, English, Greek lexicon, uh, or in an interlinear Bible, as most of you know. So this is going to be kind of a spiritual discussion, religious oriented, but it's going to touch on a lot of archaeology and history. And I'm not going to make it a long one. I'm more interested in taking questions. And, and I don't care what the subject matter is that you ask about. I'll address it. But I did want to do this first. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. So uh, Dr. Yonatan Adler, he's the one who wrote this after years of research. And that's him right there. And since I explained to most of my viewers, all of you, I think, that you really ought to look into something like this, just like I told you that you should look at Dr. Eisenman's work on James, the brother of Jesus, and uh, the New Testament Code, and those books that he's written about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and their importance in understanding what was really going on at the beginning of what we now call Christianity. This is going to prove to be as important as, as that, uh, work of Dr. Eisenman's that he did on, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is going to be as important uh, as Dr. Eisenman's work was there. This will be on Judaism and really what it was all about. Uh, there are hints in the Torah and in the Tanakh 
about what really happened, but we're, we're instructed how to read it. We're told how to interpret um, the, the things that are written. Uh, people with a lot of power and influence have, if not changed the text, which they have done, um, or made it up, they have, in fact, uh, based our understandings, made us base our understandings on their interpretations of those things. And that has caused a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. Uh, I did a video some time ago, and I stand by it. Uh, it's, it's on this channel. It's on the live uh, tab if you want to go back and look at it. And it's uh, that the Abrahamic religions are all corrupted, all of them. There isn't one that's pure. The only pure religion that you will find is seeking God on your own, not through anybody else. So let's get into it. You know, I, I don't have any of my research materials with me. I'm not going to bring my entire library up here. I just can't do that. Uh, it would have been too much. And plus we have a situation with uh, time element and some other things. So I'm not going to be able to give you uh, other references outside of what we talk about here with Dr. Adler's book other than, than you know, a, a, a just momentary comment on something that might come up. Again, I'm sorry about what the camera is doing. I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. It's very strange. It might be that the light is causing a problem. Let me, let me turn off this one light. That might be it. I'm not sure, but let me check and see. It might be causing that reflection to do something that's not too cool. So let's see if we can avoid that. Let's see if that's any better. All right. Let's see if that can do it. Hopefully that will stop it from going light and then dark. All right. Maybe not. <laughs> but we'll see if it works. Oh boy, yeah, that's pretty dark, isn't it? Yeah, we'll just go with it. All right, like I say, I'm traveling, so I don't have all my things here that I, I'd like to have. All right, so why is this important? Well, when I wrote The Crimson Thread, when I did my research, when I got with Dr. Eisenman and the other people that I've talked about so often, uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Altman from Jerusalem University, Dr. James Tabor from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill, with Dr. David Price, and a few others. Uh, after the study of many years and getting deep into it, I, I really decided that there were some damning things that happened to the claims of Judaism, and of course, uh, also, um, since Christianity is based on that, some real problems with it. Uh, bottom line, however, is that I think that the principles, uh, basically, of Christianity make sense. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you and love God, even if you do not understand him or comprehend him. Um, try your best to, to, find, to find him or to make yourself, even more so, make yourself available that he would want to, to discuss things with you. And that's a difficult thing to understand and more to accomplish. But the search is as important as the destination because it teaches us what's really important. And if we're willing to, to throw away the garbage and stick with the good fruit, I think it has a, a great advantage to us. What's going on in the Middle East right now? I could talk about Ukraine. I do believe that Ukraine and this thing that's happening in the, in the Middle East are tied together. I've talked about it in some Obscure terms in the past, talking about ridding the land of white Christians, of those that the people uh, who live in the Middle East in that one little country call uh, goy, uh, call uh, beasts of the field, uh, and Amalek. And of course, it's more than just the Amalekites in the Old Testament. They include anybody that doesn't go along with them as being their enemy. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all those Talmudic verses or the Torah verses that those Talmudic comments are made upon. I'm not going to do that tonight. What we're going to do is just let you know that there are good men and women out there like Dr. Adler, who despite the fact that he lives in Israel, and I'm going to read his bio here in just a minute, uh, is willing to come out and show these things. And one of the, one of the key points for me 
was to show that, that these religions have been altered. You know, even in the New Testament, you have Jesus uh, pretty much uh, damning the oral law, which became the Talmud, uh, the written Talmud. Uh, he, he didn't care for the oral law, and that's an indication that he had some Samaritan ties, as I've said, because the Samaritans only accepted the Torah. They did not accept the rest of the Jewish Tanakh, which is the rest of the Old Testament. Um, so, uh, as a result of that, uh, the Samaritans reject the oral law, uh, the Talmud in particular, and, and everything connected to it. Well, Jesus did the same thing. He rejected the oral law. So that's one of the other reasons why I suspect that he really was a Samaritan. And if you haven't heard me talk about that, you can go back and listen to some of those uh, presentations that I've already made. But that's not even important for our study today. What's important for our discussion today is Dr. Adler's book, and uh, basically what he is saying is, as I explained, uh, I don't know, three or four videos back when I brought his book up for the first time, when I heard him give a three-hour presentation on his findings. So I, I know a lot about this already, even before I've read it. But his, his uh, thesis and what he has basically proven, I think, with his archaeological investigation is that Judaism uh, did not, as, as we hear about it, uh, did not come into being until after. Actually, it started to come about during the Babylonian captivity, uh, but it really didn't kick off uh, to where it was um, in any kind of a unified way until the Maccabean period, the Hasmonean period, which, of course, is around uh, 250 B.C. to 150 B.C., that area in there. Uh, and then, uh, then they made other adjustments as they tried to appease the Greeks and the Romans. That's been my thesis for a long time. And as such, uh, it casts a lot of doubt on much of everything that's written. Uh, there are problems in the Torah, but there are also a, a great many problems in the Tanakh, and I've explained one of those being David taking the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh to Jerusalem was not something God wanted, in my estimation, but was a political move on David's part, if David even existed. This, this, there, there are archaeologists that say that they've proven that he did, but regardless of that, uh, the whole idea was is that a story came about uh, by a people that wanted a, 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 an identity. And they were willing to uh, bring these, I'm being careful of my choice of words here, that they were willing to bend the rules to bring these stories and, and together <coughs> for making this identity uh, because it didn't exist before. And Dr. Adler, I think, has proven that it didn't exist as a unified uh, religious body before, even national body for that matter. Uh, but they, they invented using other sources and their own uh, oral legends and those things and what they did have written down and came up with a, a story of their people that is really quite enlightening, I think. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not demeaning the fact that it couldn't have had some inspiration I think I've told you I have a lot of trust uh, in, uh, if nothing else, in using the original language to decipher the deeper meanings. So, you know, God can certainly get in there, but whether this thing is the immutable, ineffable, uh, inerrant word of God, I, I disagree with that 100% for a lot of reasons. And uh, as Voltaire said, uh, if you want to have people commit atrocities, just get them to, to believe in absurdities. His actual quote was, um, if, if you can believe in absurdities, you can believe, uh, you, you, you can commit atrocities. Something like that. And it's very true. We're seeing that in Israel right now. We're seeing that in Ukraine. We're seeing that in a lot of so-called Christian and Judeo-Christian countries. That if the Abrahamic covenant was not corrupted, these people would not be engaging in these slaughters and th uh, thieveries. They just wouldn't. Okay, so let's talk about Dr. Adler so that you guys can order this book, okay? Uh, I've shown you his picture. Let me read his brief bio here. I'm going to have to put my glasses on. Okay. 
Yonatan Adler is Associate Professor in the Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology at Ariel University in Israel. He has served as a member of the State of Israel's Council for Archaeology since his 2018 appointment by the Minister of Culture. I'm going to read the inside cover here of the dust jacket. The intellectual parameters of this ambitious project are nothing short of breathtaking. This is a very serious work that calls for much admiration and praise. Now, obviously a lot of dedicated religious people, and, and Zionists in particular, are not going to like that, even though Zionists don't uh, really depend on the Torah or any religious uh, uh, teachings. They, they violate them all the time, as they are now over in Israel. Um, the fact is, is that, you know, they, like, like our leaders in our government in the United States, they will cite the Constitution when it benefits them, and they will ignore it when it doesn't. And that's the same thing over there. They continue. That was by Eric Myers of Duke University who gave that review. Let's read the rest of it. Throughout much of history, the Jewish way of life has been characterized by strict adherence to the practices and prohibitions legislated by the Torah. Dietary laws, ritual purity, circumcision, Sabbath regulations, holidays, and more. But precisely when... Did this unique way of life first emerge, and why specifically at that time? In this revolutionary news study, Yonatan Adler methodically engages ancient texts and archaeological discoveries to reveal the earliest evidence of Torah observance among ordinary Judeans. And you're going to find out that that was the Maccabean or Hasmonean period, although it had its roots uh, during and subsequent to the Babylonian captivity, okay? He examines the species of animal bones in ancient rubbish heaps, the prevalence of purification pools and chalk vessels in Judean settlements, the dating of figural representations in decorative and functional arts, evidence of such practices as tefillin and mezuzot, and much more to reconstruct when ancient Judean society first adopted the Torah as authoritative law. Ouch. Focusing on the lived experience of the earliest Torah observers, observers, this investigative study transforms much of what we thought we knew about the Genesis and early development of Judaism. Now I'm going to read the back of the book. These are some reviews, and I'll tell you who, who does them. First one is, an impressive and important book, the rare case of the ability of one scholar to master the textual sources and the archaeological data, combine them into a comprehensive thesis, and arrive at a well-argued and persuasive solution to one of the thorniest questions in the history of Judaism. It didn't start at Mount Sinai. It probably didn't even begin with Abraham. That was from... Amahat Mazar, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Next. This pioneering and provocative book constitutes a major contribution to contemporary scholarship on the origins of Judaism. Adler carefully juxtaposes archaeological and literary evidence on key aspects of ancient Jewish identity formation, reframing the debate on the origins of Judaism in terms of what can be established on what can be established. Not hearsay, not passing down legends, um, whatever. The facts on the ground. Anyone seriously interested in Judaism's origins will want to engage with this book. That's from Jonathan Klawans of Boston University. Next, Yonatan Adler's challenging and judicious analysis of a wealth of archaeological and textual data argues convincingly for the profound significance of the early Hellenistic period in the formation of Judaism as we know it. That's from Lawrence Schiffman of New York University. That's what I'm talking about, the Hasmonean period. And the Seleucids, you know, when they came, the Seleucids were the Greeks when they came into, uh, into Palestine there. Based on, a fascinating, next, based on a fascinating and comprehensive analysis of texts in archaeology, Adler concludes that Judaism emerged either in the early Hellenistic period or 
in the period following the Maccabean revolt against the Greeks, the Hellenistic uh, rulers, when, he argues persuasively, the Hasmoneans adopted Pentateuchal law to unify the population of the new Jewish state under the Hasmonean kings, who were not rightfully kings anyway. They weren't even Udites. That's from Jody Magnus, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. That's the same university that uh, Dr. Uh, James Tabor uh, retired from. And then finally, this one, uniting archaeology with the written sources, Yonatan Adler has illuminated the practice and piety of ordinary Jews of the sample, Second Temple era. Drawing on this work, this book proposes a bold and original thesis for when the Torah became the foundation text, setting the standards for the lives of Jews. That's Albert I. Baumgarten, Baumgarten from Bar Ilan University, and the book was printed by Yale University Press. So what we're talking about here is basically that Judaism was not a unified uh, group of religious worshipers, and not even a national one. Uh, I've often talked about the formation of the Bloch Hebrew uh, instead of the Proto-Hebrew, the, the, the uh, early, earlier method of writing. And there's been a, an argument over whether the Phoenicians uh, were the ones who the, the Hebrews copied uh, for their alphabet or whether it was the other way around. And it really doesn't matter. Uh, the point is, is that uh, in the Babylonian period, along with the effort to create a text that would unify the people, uh, they also created a, a new alphabet, alphabet with the block Hebrew, and I've talked about this uh, to some extent before. Again, it was a way to get away from any possibility that they were using the Phoenician alphabet uh, and identifying themselves with uh, their own alphabet. And again, that happened during the Babylonian captivity with Ezra, uh, Jeremiah, etc. So we have a lot of evidence to suggest, as I have long explained, that this entire situation, uh, while it has a lot of good um, social, a lot of good social lessons, a lot of good lessons about how we should deal with people, so does Shakespeare. So does Hemingway. Mark Twain, for that matter. Um, I think it important that both the Rabbi Hillel, which who lived, uh, he, he lived in about uh, 30 B.C., 25 B.C., something like that, and subsequently Jesus, the one, the man that you know as Jesus, and his brother James, who we talked about in Dr. Eisenman's book, James, the Brother of Jesus, narrowed everything down. They did away with all the legalese that the Levites, the priests, the lawyers put in here to keep the people tied up and to, to force them into a lifestyle that was subservient to the priests. That's really my estimation of what was going on there. Uh, the whole idea of, of Moses being a Levite and the Levites controlling so much uh, and then the, the, the sacrifices and all that, which were then given to the Levites, not just uh, to God, that was giving it to God, was giving it to the Levites. Um, the tithes, the offerings, and all this stuff. This is an economic system. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in, uh, especially in the, in, in, in the Book of Acts in the New Testament, and uh, uh, you can also read it in, in other parts of the New Testament, even some of the Pauline letters, there was, in fact, a difficulty between Paul and and James, the brother of Jesus, and uh, we see those. And I'm not going to get into that here tonight. You know I don't have any respect for Paul uh, for reasons I'm not going to get into again here. Uh, you can go back and look at that. That's the reason why. But James had problems too, and I've often said this. I think the, the, the illustration, the representation in the New Testament that this person, this man, Jesus, had a problem with his own family was very real. 
I think he understood who he really was. He was not a Jew, <laughs> as I've said. He was from the tribe, uh, descended from Joseph of Egypt, received the birthright through Ephraim. That's the man we're talking about, because even the Jews will say that their Davidic Messiah doesn't die. He's successful in his mission. He doesn't die. But this other one does in the course of his mission, this suffering servant, this Messiah ben Joseph. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, again, you can go to my book, The Crimson Thread, and you can read just the introduction to it, and it's online here. You can go to my Reading the Crimson Thread in the playlist above. Uh, go to the Reading the Crimson Thread, and in there you will find uh, links to that book that you can read online. It's not as fun as reading a book in your hand, at least I don't think so, you know, but at least it's there. But if you read nothing else of The Crimson Thread, read the introduction. I think that's extremely important for you to understand kind of where I'm coming from. Now, what does this do to us? Uh, Dr. Adler is going to show, as I've just pointed out in, in some sum, uh, summary terms, that Judaism was a creation. Uh, and it happened apparently about the time of the Babylonian captivity. There were some things that occurred prior to that, and those historical, possibly, uh, explanations I've read about before. Uh, for instance, the, the fact that uh, under the reign of King Uzziah, uh, the high priest and the scribe took a book that they had found to Uzziah and said, hey, we just found the book of the law, and we don't know for certain whether it was the Torah. Right now, it looks like it was not the Torah in its complete form, but possibly parts of the book of Deuteronomy. And I think I'm certain that that's where Dr. Adler is going to, to go with this, too. Um, and it's right in the, in the Old Testament. So, you know, what, what is all this about them having the, the law of Moses and following it uh, verbatim and then uh, tearing down other people's religious practices because they weren't doing what, the Jews said they were supposed to do. There are evidences of polytheistic uh, understandings in early Judaism. I don't even call it Judaism. Let's call it, let's call it the early Hebraic Israelite, and that's probably even going too far, um, societies. Um, they were not homogenous by any, by any means. And as I have explained several times in the past, Ezra had a difficult time trying to bring all this together to appease both the Yahwists and the Eloists. The Eloists being basically the polytheists. That's how it would be. Elohim is plural. The Jews have gone and, and people who have translated the Old Testament uh, have gone to great lengths to make the word Elohim about a single God, and uh, it just isn't the case. As I pointed out several times, my estimation of the first, first verse of Genesis, which says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that word God there is Elohim, and it would be the same thing as if you said, because it's singular, so everybody says, so it, mean, it means a single God. Well, no, it means a council of the gods is exactly what it means, and we get that from Psalms 82 as well. And yes, I realize that there is a, a central figure there that is controlling that council, but still, the word in, in Genesis talks about a council. So in other words, if, if you were to say the Congress, the United States Congress, the Congress passed a law, the singular, all right? But it has plural connotations because the Congress is made up of you know, 500 and some odd individuals, right? Both the House and the Senate. Well, it's the same thing with the word Elohim when you see it. Now, it gets more specific later, as I've talked about. You know, it talks about the Lord God, which is really Yahweh God. I'm just going to say it that way, even though I don't think that's the way it's pronounced. But um, anytime you see the Lord God in the King James Bible, it's really saying Yahweh God, the YHVH God. So it's identifying a specific God. And then we have problems like in Deuteronomy 32 and, and like I said, Psalms 82 and some other places where it, it, it talks about God being part of the ground, that these different gods create or 
or have control over these different areas of the ground. And you're seeing that right now in the Middle East with Israel, who's claiming that their God gave them that land. They're arguing that that land is there because of a 3,500 to 4,000 year old claim that probably doesn't really exist in actuality. And their God is attached to that ground. That's really why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, I'm not saying those people uh, that are doing this, there's some really horrible things going on there, and I'm not going to get into the political connotations of all that tonight. I think most of those of you who follow me know that I find what Israel is doing is reprehensible. They're doing a, a, a genocide to others that uh, since they supposedly went through one, they shouldn't be doing that if they didn't like it done to them. Why are they doing it to somebody else? Well, again, they read this with the Talmudic commentaries that justify the slaughter of anybody that doesn't go along with their point of view. Not all Jews are like that. Uh, I, I, on, on Twitter X, I, I've talked about at Torah Jews and at Torah Judaism, and they're very careful to say Torah. I'm wondering sometimes if, if and I don't know all the sects of Judaism, uh, there might be some that are more... Um, tied to the Torah than the Tanakh as a whole, but I get the distinct impression that the Torah Jews and Torah Judaism uh, reject the Talmudic, Rabbinic Judaism, that they don't go along with that, certainly not the Zionistic, xenophobic, uh, nationalistic version of that. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say about it. When I get into this, I'm going to start reading this tonight, and uh, you know, really getting into a deep... Uh, but I think that my summary of what it's about is, is fairly accurate, and I base that upon, again, the three-hour lecture that I listened to by Dr. Adler uh, and also the other uh, accompanying materials here, and, frankly, my own research. Uh, yes, I stepped outside the box. Uh, I didn't go with the status quo. I didn't go with the, with, with the, the gang, because I found that that's usually not a good way to go. Usually the gang, the big group, the majority, are not in the right. I could tell you some stories about that, but I won't bother tonight. Okay, so I would, I would suggest to everybody, if you're interested, this is going to read pretty hard. Let me just pick a page. <laughs> I'll just pick a page. How this book is arranged. Let's just read that. This is on page... 23 of the introduction. Each of the following chapters will be devoted to a discrete set of practices or prohibitions that characterized ancient Judaism. Chapter 1 examines the dietary laws, especially the prohibited meats enumerated in Leviticus 2 and Deuteronomy 14, 3 to 21. Chapter 2 investigates the observance of the ritual purity laws, especially those concentrated in Leviticus 11 to 15 and Numbers 19. Chapter 3 examines the penitential prohibition against the depiction of human and animal forms in the artwork in Exodus 24, 5, Deuteronomy 4, 15, 18, and Deuteronomy 5, 79. Chapter 4 investigates the ritual practices of tefillin and mezuzah through a literal interpretation of Exodus 13, 9, 16, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11. And chapter 5 explores six distinct practices that characterize Judaism in the first century CE. We're talking about 100 B.C. to 1 A.D. Circumcision, the Sabbath prohibitions, the Passover sacrifice, and the festival of unleavened bread, fasting on the Day of Atonement, the two essential rituals of the Sukkot festival, and having a continually lit seven-branch menorah in the Jerusalem temple. Chapter 6 will explore the emergence of the synagogue, which, while not directly appearing in the Pentateuch, important point, was the institution through which knowledge of the Torah itself was disseminated among the Judean masses on a regular <laughs> weekly basis. If any of you have ever be belonged to a religion, or let, let's just say you go into public schools, they indoctrinate you. They make sure they indoctrinate you into their political ideology. It's just the way it works. You go to a church, and they are indoctrinating you into their dogma, their doctrine. Well... Dr. Adler admits that that's what they were doing as well. The, Jew, the Jews in that, from the period of the um, Babylonian captivity through uh, the Hasmonean rule, uh, the Maccabean period. That's the origin of it. 
So I won't comment any more on this. I'll go ahead and, and I'll start reading tonight. And uh, maybe I'll come back and give you an update after I get through the bit. Again, this isn't to tear down anybody's religious beliefs or faith. But it's time we grow up and, and, and honestly ask the questions that matter. Um, in my book, The Crimson Thread, and in some others, I've quoted several authors that basically said, uh, uh, ignoring the truth is no way to honor God. And sometimes you just have to be willing to look at the evidence uh, instead of following institutional demands. Okay. Well, with that introduction, let's see what you guys are all talking about here. Thanks for prayers for the family. Yeah, that's definitely needed. I'll tell you, thank you so much. And again, I'm not sure why the camera is going in and out. That's kind of a frustrating thing, but I really don't know what's causing it. Uh, it could be the, uh, the, the internet here on the phone um, in this particular area is, uh, and, and the uh, Wi-Fi in, in the house and all that, uh, is actually controlled by a tower, a directional tower that's about five miles that way. And so we're very, very foggy right now, so it might be that that, that uh, connection there is, is being interfered with by the fog. Okay. Let's see if anybody has any specific questions here. Oh, yeah, and it could be this too. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It could be that as well. And I, I'm sorry I don't have anything else that I can use. All the walls are white. <laughs> so I wouldn't make any difference. And I don't really have anything to put up. But thank you. Yeah, that's very likely. Um... Felicia always has nice things to say. <laughs> Thank you, Felicia. Yes, Ronnie Mann was with you. Yeah, that's right. That was right. And I didn't hear it all. As I told you, Felicia, I, I've been really tied up. Um, okay. Uh, Roosevelt's here. Hi, Roosevelt. Thank you for being here. Yes, this is, this is probably... You, you asked if I would cover more of this kind of information material, and of course I will. Uh, but, you know, when you do this kind of thing, you got to realize... The, the weight of the responsibility you're putting on yourself. I mean, you know, calling out uh, world-class religions is not always the healthiest thing to do, <laughs> you know. And I, I've been after rabbis. I, I've been coming down on rabbis and ministers and a lot of people over the last, uh, uh, well, since October 7th and before that, but since October 7th, some of the, as you know, some of the rabbis and other ministers that I've had some respect for when they came out and said it's okay to slaughter everybody you know, that st basically stands against you, and especially anybody who's not Jew, and that's what they're saying. They, they put it in other terms, but that's really what they're saying. It was just too much, and I finally had to call them out. And so if you're on my ex account, if you watch, I even did it this afternoon. I sent it to Netanyahu, uh, the chief rabbi of, of Israel, uh, the IDF, and then some other people for their their information not that they'll ever see it but i figure i've got to at least make the effort to to call them out and yes i'm chastising them and i think rightly and justly so they're they're beasts what they're doing yes i know there have been other other uh, genocides even in our own lifetimes uh, rwanda for instance was a problem the things that have happened in other areas of the world but the difference here is that is the state of Israel saying that they're doing it because God told them to in here? See the difference? It's not just a, a difference of societies, a difference in cultures, a difference in origins, you know, where, where they are, like the difficulties in Rwanda, for instance, the different tribes. No, th these people are saying... They don't even obey Torah on a national level. They do things that are prohibited by Torah, and they prohibit things that Torah requires. So they're not 
the Jewish they're not they do not represent the Jewish people around the world they do not they represent a basically a small group of people that wanted to usurp the land from others and kill anybody that resisted them that's really what it's about so I can, I come down on these rabbis and these people and uh, it's disgusting how they act they are not abiding by the Abrahamic covenant the Abrahamic promise uh, to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth all of them that's not just talking about the nations of the, the nation of Israel or the different tribes they were supposed to be a blessing not a curse but that's all they've been now for at least 75 years and some people would say longer than that um, so anyway thanks for being here Roosevelt oh and she's uh, she, yeah right here it says uh, Roosevelt has put down, you can read Roy's book, The Crimson Thread, and, and Roosevelt has put the, uh, the link right there. So if you, want, if you want to get that, sorry I didn't put it in, you know, I never, I didn't really think I'd cover it at all. But it does tie in, I mean, what, what's, what's really fascinating here is that my work with the Dead Sea Scrolls, Dr. Eisenman, my study of history, um, the little archaeology I was able to get into, uh, you know, pointed me into this direction that uh, our faith is in these things is precarious. Not because our faith is, is wrong, but because what we have based it on has been, um, by and large, tampered with and even lied about. And now I've got the archaeological evidence that Dr. Adler presents that will solidify uh, my position. Oh, BP Earthwatch posted a great study today. He told me he was going to do a thing on Deuteronomy 32, I believe. I think that's what he was going to do it on. Um, and he and I talked about it, so I'll, I'll go look and, and see what that is. It'll be interesting to see uh, what he talks about. Uh, he called me up and he said, Hey, would you give me a, uh, a, a translation of this, uh, this, this, these couple of sentences from, uh, from it was from Deuteronomy. And uh, I looked at it, and uh, I know what it says in, in English. And I know what it says in the greater number of so-called Bible translations out there, and uh, even in the Hebrew. And so uh, this, this was a little fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the earliest uh, inscriptions that we have of anything uh, to do with Judaism uh, Israel and all that and it was a Dead Sea Scroll fragment with uh, a portion of Deuteronomy 32 on it and the, the common translation is uh, that it's talking about the sons of Israel or the sons of others and even in the Hebrew linear Bible and again I don't have it here uh, it, it, even in the Hebrew it says Israel. Well, in this fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it shows that the original saying was sons, not sons of Israel, not sons of kings or whatever like that. It definitely says sons of God. And that really, really puts a damper on the trustworthiness, so, and I, I told you about it before, uh, even as good as Strong's is, uh, the Strong's Concordance, and Brown Driver and Briggs, and uh, some of those other concordances, and the Gesinius, the Hebrew lexicon, those people that worked on those things had agendas because they had to appease their, the people that were financing them. They couldn't go too far off the tracks. So as I pointed out in a lot of my presentations, their translations are suspect. Uh, and that's why I use Notarikon so often 
to break down the words into their individual letters so that I can understand the real meaning of the word, not what somebody else tells me it is. And uh, it's, it's a very effective system. Now, some people might say, but Roy, you're saying that all this was manufactured. Um, well, again, just like with Shakespeare or with uh, Mark Twain, Hemingway, or any other great author, there's inspiration there. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come through. And so people say, well, then it is, the Bible is the immutable, ineffable Word of God. Well, no, because it, it's not always telling you the truth. And uh, again, my, my explanation of uh, Shiloh that I've talked about in the past and uh, the Ark of the Covenant going to Jerusalem under David as just an example. And then the situation with finding the Book of the Law, which was probably Deuteronomy in Josiah's period, uh, it, it, those are problems. Those are big, big problems, and that's just touching the, the surface. So, uh, you just have to be willing to, to, to hold back your, your, your worry and your rage and your, and your, uh, your feelings of being lost when you look into these things. And just trust that what you're really doing is you're trying to find the truth of the matter. Like a criminal investigation. You know, when you start off as a criminal investigator, you do. You have a hypothesis. You have you say, okay, well, I think this happened. And then you set about either trying to prove it or disprove it. Okay? Usually trying to disprove it's a better way to go forward. Well, people don't want to do that with religious matters. They feel that if they, they attack something from the position of trying to disprove it, that they're being unfaithful. Quite to the contrary. Even the Tanakh says that God told us to reason with him as one man reasons with another. So I, I check all of these things as I go through, and I don't take them verbatim in, in this. Okay, I don't take them verbatim. I test them against other things, and those other things are the two great commandments. And now... Not only do I have the historical background uh, that I've, and, and some archaeology, of course. I'm not an archaeologist, though. But some, some archaeology I've used, and now I've got this that will close the loop on, I think, the proof that modern-day Judaism really came about in the 2nd to 3rd century B.C. under the Hasmonean Maccabean rulers as a way to unify the people uh, with Ezra's assistance back after the Babylonian captivity, as I've said. And then after the uh, defeat of the people of, of Judea in the revolt of 70 AD when Rome totally crushed them, uh, we, we have more evidence that Something else was created after that at the Council of Yavna, as I've talked about in the past, which was the birthplace, the birth time of not just Judaism at this point, but modern rabbinic Talmudic Judaism, which actually <laughs> doesn't follow this at all, <laughs> almost not at all. So now I'll have the archaeological evidence, and again, Dr. Adler says that... Uh, and I'm going to get into the details, but says that the, the, the as Judaism exists today, and certainly the Judaism of, of the first century A.D., which Jesus was apparently so, the person you know as Jesus was uh, uh, questioning so much, uh, really didn't have its, its uh, origins uh, much earlier than 250 B.C. Well, that was a long explanation. Sorry, Roosevelt. <laughs> The founder of the Zionist movement was actually a Sufi Muslim. Yeah. And the, and the founder of uh, Islam used the Talmud and uh, early Messianic uh, Messianism, uh, Christianity basically, to, to formulate Islam. Isn't that into the, the Quran? Paul hijacked the Christian movement. Yeah, he did, Roosevelt. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder if maybe he did us a favor, but the problem with it is, is that it became too uh, ethereal. And Paul's God was ethereal, esoteric. Uh, uh, there wasn't anything real to it, and that was that was 
not the case. I mean, you you look at the the the, uh, and again, you know, we're talking about things that were probably tampered with and changed. But uh, when you read the old, uh, you know, like in Genesis and places like that, you're talking about a God that that was there and associating with men as a man often, like with Abraham at the plains of Mamre. The problem with Paul is that he never met Jesus. He supposedly, uh, you know, had this revelation. Uh, and there are all kinds of problems with that, as I've talked about in the past. Uh, because he doesn't do what he was told. If, if God told him, if Jesus told him, uh, don't persecute me and go over here and do this and that. Well, he didn't do it. He did exactly almost opposite to what he was told to do. I, I consider that Paul was an opportunist. He was part of the, the movement to obscure um, uh, the development of, of Messianic Christianity, Messianic Judaism for that matter, uh, and to uh, help the Romans defeat um, the Messianic movement. That's what I think. And his, his difficulties with James are evidence of that. Again, though, James, James wasn't a clean one owner as far as I'm concerned. He was a good guy, but... but uh, he, uh, he and his brother Jesus, I think, did uh, run into each other's uh, uh, emotional roots from time to time, just like the New Testament does say. Uh, Go read Psalms. I see some comments being made here. Go read Psalms 82. Read Psalms 82. About the council. And uh, Dr. Michael Heiser would say that that would still say that uh, Yahweh is the unique one above all the other gods. But there are other scriptures uh, that, that, that say that he only got a portion, not everything. So we're, we're dealing with early Eloist versus Yahwist philosophies. And we have to remember again that the gods to those people were, were, atta were, were attached to the ground. The ground was where God was, not in some... Far, that's the way the ancients looked at it, not in some far away uh, place. Even the constellations were actually considered points on the ground, not even in heaven. They, they identified different places where you were on the ground, which we know about land navigation today and navigation at sea when you're using the constellations. But these things were actually projected onto the ground. So the ground and the worship of the gods of the ground uh, were evident, as I'm sure Dr. Adler is going to get into, in ancient Judaism. Now, the Jews would say that the, that the northern kingdoms, the, the Ephraimites uh, uh, and those people, the northern Israel tribes, were engaging in uh, idol worship. Well, that's an easy accusation to make when you don't have uh, anybody to, to confront you about it, because... Now, you know, we just take it for granted that the, that the northern tribes were destroyed and taken away uh, after uh, all, you know, Hezekiah and all these guys tried to take down the, the, the altars, the high holy places, the, the worship of uh, these false deities, um, and uh, without explanation, was it really, in fact, an effort to, as I'm as Dr. Evers pointed out in some of the things that I've read already, uh, an effort to politically unify the people in Judea. It was an effort to unify those folks under one banner and to basically say anybody that thinks differently, God's going to destroy. Well, as I've often said, you're only responsible for what you know. You're not responsible for what somebody else knows. You just have to be asking God all the time for direction and, and, and go the way that he, he sends you. 
And that's not an easy test because sometimes you don't know if it's God or not. And uh, sometimes the tests that you have to apply to find that out are not pleasant to go through. I'll just put it that way. They can, they can be pretty, uh, well, it's the refiner's fire. You know, you're not saved because of what somebody else does for you. Otherwise, why do you have a refiner's fire to go through? Make you, turn you into gold. Oh, if you truly took too many Kobe shots, I do believe Jesus knew who he was. Matthias, I don't know if you're talking to me or not, but I haven't had one Kobe shot. <laughs> okay. I didn't even get Kobe. Um, you do believe Jesus knew who he was? Yeah, I think he knew who he was too, and he knew he wasn't a Jew. He knew he wasn't. He told the, the lady at the well, the Samaritan lady at the well, that he was the Samaritan Messiah, not the Jewish Messiah. Jews accused him of being a Samaritan and a devil. He denied being a devil. He didn't deny being a, a Samaritan. And then, like I said a few minutes ago, he had no respect for the oral traditions. Neither did the Samaritans. Now, I don't think he was uh, Jewish at all. Jewish by nationality? Okay, yeah. Jewish by his, uh, his lineage and all that? Nope, apparently not. Well, I'm not going to get into the different names of God and who those gods are and whether they're just further appellations of Yahweh or not. But uh, just saying El is fine. Uh, did you know that the word Allah that so many Christians and Jews are so upset about that, uh, that uh, the Muslims use is actually in the New Testament? It's an Aramaic. Allah. Instead of Ali, it's Allah. They get Allah from that. And yet, everybody wants to get all upset that they worship a different God. Well, it's all been corrupted, as I said. All the Abrahamic religions are corrupted. There isn't one that's pure now. Okay. Well, it depends, Robert Winslow. Uh, yeah, in Genesis there, where it talks about the days of creation, yeah, they're just periods of time. Yeah. It, it doesn't mean day in the sense of 24 hours. No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, um, there's, a, there's a lot more. And that's why I have so much respect for Genesis. I think if there is a, although you can see the effort by Ezra to uh, resolve this Yahwist, Eloist uh, disagreement, even in Genesis, there, there are some priceless pearls in Genesis. Uh, not so much in, in the other four books of the Torah. Uh, as I've said before, I, I suspect that those were Levitical, Levite, priestly, lawyer craft uh, for economic and for political control. Or there'll be some people who'll be pissed off with me saying that, but that's just, I've, I've felt that way for a long time. Although some of it's good. I mean, you know, uh, well, I won't get into any details. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so anyway, that's my answer to you on that, uh, Robert Winslow. Uh, <laughs> Tim Ferger, the Roy, foremost Hebrew scholar, military strategist, social media personality. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. I'm sure you meant it as a compliment, Tim, but I don't feel like that sometimes. You know, it, it's kind of stressful, you know, because like I said, like I said a few minutes ago, even in my book, The Crimson Thread, to take on a, a, a world religion is a pretty daunting task. And, and when you realize that so much of what we have built here, I, I know Christianity has done some great things. I know that, you know. But it's also done some really bad things under the guise of Christianity. And I'm not going to get into those other than I'll just say this one. And that was the killing of Hypatia, the... Uh, the lead philosopher, the head philosopher of the Library of Alexandria, and the Christians killed her because she wouldn't bow to them, bow to their interpretation. And then, of course, we saw the Inquisition during the, the Dark Ages, so-called, and we saw the, the, late, the Salem Witch Trials. These are just examples of what Christianity is capable of. So if you think that, 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 that their belief in absurdities 
it will not cause them to commit atrocities. Historically, it's proven that it does. And they do it again today. There are Christians that will, will say that they do God a favor if they kill you, just like the Muslims say, just like the Jews say. Merely for not abiding their take on doctrine and dogma. Ah, Fozzie and W. This is an interesting one because I've covered it before. Fozzie and W says, Your faith tells you to turn the other cheek and wait for your Savior. The other side can kill, destroy that consequence or hell to come. Actually, that's not what it means. See, that's what happens when you read the, 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 the translations and you don't know anything about the culture of the people at the time. That statement that Jesus says, when they strike you on one cheek, turn to them the other also, that's not saying that you're submitting to them. It's a challenge. It's a justification to act. It's not submission. It's not passivity. You've been taught to understand it that way because that helps the government. I mean, look at the government. Who, who, who wants to have control of all violence? They talk about, uh, oh, we're upset when people want to do violence. The FBI says that, and the Justice Department, that's when we go after somebody, when they say something that could be considered violent. Well, what does the government turn to when it doesn't get its way? Violence. Jesus wasn't saying to be passive. He was saying, when they hit you, let them hit you a second time, because then they, then you will accept the challenge. Let me tell you how it worked. They slap you this way, and then they backhand you the other way. It's a challenge. You hit me there, hit me once more. The law says that you have to give a person a warning. You can let them do it to you twice. You don't let them do it to you the third time. So you misunderstand the scripture. It's just like, be as, be as uh, um, mild as a, as a dove uh, and as wise as a serpent. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Have you ever watched what happens when one dove gets attacked by a hawk? I have. You know what happens? All the doves come and kill the hawk. These parables and things are much more important than you realize. You're supposed to stick together and protect yourselves. Be as harmless, as wise as a serpent. Know when to strike. Serpent won't strike when it thinks it's going to get hurt. Wise as a serpent. Know when to strike. Don't strike when you're going to get hurt. And harmless as a dove. Don't do anything. But if you attack one of our own, we're coming for you. It's just like the Native Americans. A lot of what they, they teach in their philosophies is because of what they've observed in nature. Well, the ancients were the same way. Same way. I can tell you there's nobody that's a son of light in Israel right now. I don't know who this person is that they're getting ready to show as the Messiah. Um, there, there are a couple of them that I'm aware of. Um, but... Uh, They're not sons of light. No, they're not. Oh, right, not light. Oh, fuzzy. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Jesse of BP Earthwatch talks about who the scribes were and how, how they, they became the controlling factor. They're, they're the lawyers. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the, the priests were basically the, the, uh, the educated class, the lawyers of the day, not just priests, not just scribes. So, yeah, they did some really shady things. Even Jeremiah talked about it. I, I quoted it to you. I think it's like, uh, Jeremiah 8.8, 8, where he says the scribes have lied. Another proof that there are problems in here and that you have to be willing to put aside your prejudices and your and your false notions and approach things with reason and humility. 
Sorry I'm a little tired tonight, as you can imagine, taking care of... Uh, um, yeah, that's true, Roosevelt, Jesus' teaching. But Buddhism isn't a religion, actually. It's a philosophy that you, you can be anything and still be a Buddhist. And there's, there's a lot of truth to it. I agree. Uh, but anyway, getting back to this thing about me being tired, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting week. And it's going to be like this for some time. Is this Paul, Saul? I'm not sure what you're talking about, Debbie. Or somebody else talked about. Are we at war right here at, at home, Mr. Potter? Tony asked that. Oh, absolutely. Your own government's at war with you. And it has been for a long time. Debbie Donovan asks, is this Paul, Saul? I'm not sure what you're asking, Debbie, but yeah. Um, Saul uh, is the name in both in Josephus and uh, when he first starts out, and then he, then he becomes Paul, which is kind of an interesting change. Um, he was a Benjaminite. He claims he was a Benjaminite. What was, the, what was the, uh, the blessing to Benjamin? That he'd be a ravening wolf. <laughs> and the first king of Israel wasn't a Judite. He was a Benjaminite. King Saul, a ravening wolf. And that's exactly right. Judah is, is a lion. Well, when you, when you write your own history, you can, you can say nice things about yourself, I guess. Debbie, I feel that the last super was many men's proof of betrayal. On his 12, he sold them out. Can you put a link to Psalm? I feel the last supper was many men's proof of betrayal. On his 12, who sold them out. Can you put a link to Psalm? Uh, I think you're asking about uh, the, the, the betrayal there. One, one of the things that happened in the New Testament, um, the people that formulated the New Testament, and I'm saying it that way, they had access to this stuff, and of course, they, they had the, the outline, I guess you could say, of what they wanted their Messiah to look like and what they wanted him to say. Uh, but again, Debbie, what I'm going back to is that this Jesus character was not a Udite. He was an Ephraimite. He was a Samaritan. The Jewish Messiah, as the Jews correctly explain, according to the Tanakh and all of that, is that he defeats all of his enemies, that he doesn't die in the course of his mission. That's the Judah Messiah, okay, the Davidic Messiah. I'm saying that Jesus was the Samaritan Messiah. He was, he was the Messiah ben Joseph. He was the heir as the head of the family with the entire responsibility for the whole family. The king is only a king over Israel. The Messiah ben Joseph is the, is the father of the entire family of Noah on back to Adam. See the difference? So the ultimate responsibility is with the father of the family. The heir apparent. Oh good, thanks Debbie. Yeah, I agree, Roosevelt, and I, I, keep, I, I should be looking at some others here, too, making their comments, but our relationship with God is personal. Not everybody's supposed to build an ark, right? And not everybody kills Goliath. Not in the same way, right? You, you, you all have different things. We have, we have people that are to expound on the Word. We have people that are to, to, to perform their missions. My son Jeremy says it pretty well. He says, you know, before you came down here, um, you know, came to this particular place, God talked to you and said, uh, okay, what I want you to do is I just want you to, there's this little old lady who's, who's going to be struggling to get across the street. I, I just want you to go help her. That's the only thing you have to do in your whole life. Just do that. You know, participate. Participate in doing good. Which, as I have explained, is really what the meaning is to be in the image of God. To be in the image of God is to be a zelem. A righteous judge. That's what zealot means. Not just the way you look, but the way you act. And the Israel Israelis right now are not in the image of God. They are in the image of Moloch. Shame on... <laughs> I saw today that Elon Musk 
And not only did he go to 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 uh, the area there of October seventh and all that, but then he goes to Auschwitz. Want to talk about the history of genocide and ignore it as it occurs in your own day. Very disappointing. Jeremiah 8, emergency exit, how you doing? Yeah, emerge I, I made you a, 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 mo a moderator. Thank you for being here. Um, I think I did that, what, last last uh, live stream I did? Yeah, Jeremiah 8, 8 is important because it tells you right there that scribes lie. So how do you find out when they lie? Matarakan is one of the best ways to find out. Taking the word apart, whether it's in the block Hebrew or the, the proto-Hebrew, um, whichever, because it works either way, and you, you take those letter meanings and you break them down in the word, and about 90%, 95% of the time, it's going to work for you. That's, that's how you find out. You, you, you get the greater portion of the word, not the lesser. <laughs> and, the, and the rabbis know that. The rabbis are, I'll tell you what. The rabbis that are, that are promoting what's happening in Israel right now, they're liars and deceivers. They are going for a xenophobic, nationalistic, um, prejudiced, evil goal. They should be calling, as I, as I talk to them, as I've sent them, they should be calling all those people from Netanyahu on down to repentance, not justifying what they're doing. They got it all wrong. And I didn't, I didn't ever want to put myself in a position where I had to tell a rabbi that he's full of shit. But most of them are now, because they're Talmudic in origin. They talk a good line. They sound real pious. The idea of being a whited sepulcher is really true. And they're not just the rabbis in Israel. There are a lot of rabbis that are against what's going on and, and, and understand. I've talked about it again. At Torah Jews, at Torah Judaism on, on uh, X. And I know others. But unfortunately, the bad folks have really influenced governments around the world, especially the Western governments, and especially the United States government, Congress in particular. It's really, really bad. Yeah, Debbie, that's right. Yeah, Paul was originally Saul. Yeah, not, not King Saul, but his name was Saul. That's how he's known. He's not called Paul in uh, Josephus. He's called Saul. And there are questions as to whether or not that's even the same guy. But uh, I'm pretty sure it is. And he's also the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, he's identified as, as the liar. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he, he's in the position of the liar in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, we've been going for how long here now? Uh, well, we, I can't tell. Uh, oh man, over an hour. Okay, so I've dragged this out probably. No, Jake, Jacob, Jacob, the idea of being a deceiver, you got to be careful here, okay? Um, you got to understand, again, the culture of the time and what was going on. I'm not, I'm not justifying, you know, after what I've said already that there are problems. Um, Jacob was there were two two sons born they were twins Esau and Jacob you have to understand that in the old law I mean and it's very true today too in 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 royal lines you don't marry outside your order and in those days uh, you didn't marry outside of the of the uh, uh, Shemite line okay uh, because they wanted to they wanted to keep their their genealogy straight. Esau violated that 
and went and married uh, non-Shemite women, uh, which by the law at that time uh, negated his heirship, his right, his birthright. So uh, when, when uh, Rebecca went into Isaac and uh, said, hey, you know, uh, you got to give Jacob the birthright, uh, Isaac was reticent to do that uh, because he, he favored Esau. Why? I don't know. This is just a story. But Jacob, um, apparently with his mother's help, and, and there are problems with this, I admit, but, uh, you know, he gave Esau a chance. He said, uh, you know, um, okay, if, if you want this porridge, uh, sell me your birthright. And Esau agreed. Plus, he had already forfeited his birthright by what he was up to doing. And he actually married some of those women later, but he was in the process, apparently, um, having things to do with them. So the real problem was, of course, when he, he pretended to be Esau when he goes into his father. Yeah, that was a little shady. Um, but again, does that mean that Esau should have kept the birthright? I wouldn't want to go there. Uh, no, thanks. I, I think that, that wouldn't work. So uh, in, in, in some ways, you know, I can justify what he did. And in other ways, I find it somewhat reprehensible. But it's a lesson, I think. Another, like I said, there there are lessons to be learned in the scriptures, and uh, subsequent to that, what happened to Jacob and, and his family, I think, is is you know he he received some punishment. He lost Joseph for a while, right? Uh, his his one of his sons, Reuben, slept with one of his wives, his concubines, right? And Reuben lost all of his his uh, birthright, uh, uh, you know, so Jacob, Jacob suffered for what he did, um, he didn't get away clean, all right, but apparently it did remain there to some extent, all right, well, we've been going for a long time, an hour and 25 minutes almost, so I've, I've dragged this out longer than I meant to, I just really wanted to give you a a little information on, on this. So I'm going to start reading this uh, when I have free time, mostly in the evening. Times during the day I do too. Again, I'm in Washington State. I'm away from my library. I'm away from my research material. I'm not going to be able to give you any specifics. I'll just have to recall things as best I can. I didn't even bring a copy of the Crimson Thread with me. So that shows you uh, you know, how quickly I had to had to take off. It was virtually, I got the call and I was gone the next morning on the drive up here. So, uh, you know, we're hoping that, that things will turn out okay, but it's a rough one. This, this is as bad as it gets. All righty. I could talk about the uh, world situation, but I think uh, this shows you that, you know, history is not what we've been told. God is not what we've been told. Um, I do believe that we are literally in his image, physically and spiritually, but that we have fallen to a point where our, our representation of that image has faltered and, and even become evil in some regards. And it, it hurts my, my feelings that... Uh, people that were supposed to bring forth blessings to the nations are actually murdering them and using deception and warfare and lies and thievery instead of offering help, being a blessing, doing what Joseph did and providing food, Joseph of Egypt, providing food for those who need it. See, Jesus, that's the name Joshua. Jesus is just the Greek form of Joshua. And as I pointed out, I believe his real name was Joseph. All right, everybody. Keep your eyes on the horizon, your ears to the ground. Keep your situational awareness on high. 
things are going to get rocky this year. I think, you know, we've seen a lot already. It hasn't happened as quickly as I thought it was going to. Things, you know, sometimes slow down a little bit. But you, I put out there the uh, the information how they they're working against us and our own government refuses to protect us. We just had what happened today. Does anybody know what the Supreme Court did today? Can I ask that? Does anybody know what the Supreme Court did today? I, I shouldn't be surprised, but I'm I'm I just don't have any hope in this government at all anymore. Anybody know what the Sup Supreme Court did today? I'll just tell you. So as you know or should know, the state of Texas decided to enforce the immigration laws and protect their border. Uh, there are constitutional grounds to do that. Uh, if the federal government refuses to do its duty, the states can. So the, uh, the Supreme Court, the, the Biden administration put in a, a, uh, for a hearing on this, a decision from the Supreme Court to stop Texas from protecting its border and taking down the rate and, and forcing Texas to take down the razor wire and probably other border protections that they put up. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, Texas needs to submit to the feds. A total violation of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Total violation. The Supreme Court is out of line. And it was Amy Barrett and Chief Justice Roberts that really caused the problem. They're, your government's your enemy. It's just a fact. Yeah. So, uh, the Supreme Court... Is, they're getting threatened by somebody. I'm certain. I, I've never trusted Roberts anyway, period. Never have. So that's what happened today. You also know that uh, it's come out that Israel implemented the Hannibal Directive and killed their own people uh, purposefully. That mostly, most of the casualties were not caused by uh, Hamas that day, but by the Israeli uh, helicopter gunships and their tanks and, their, and uh, heavy weapons. Firing and killing their own people. Sometimes I think Jesus had it right. Lies and murderers just like their father. You all take care. All right, thanks for coming. Hopefully it was of some use. Get this book and read it. I'm starting right now. As soon as I close down here, I'm going to start reading it, okay? Taking copious notes and comparing it with my other research. All right. But I think Dr. Adler's on the right track, and he's basically proven, from what I can tell already, he's proven everything that I've said all along. All right. Okay. You all take care. All right. Let's see what we got to do here to get out of this thing.